Um, yeah, without further, uh, further ado, uh, we have Mike May waiting to give us all his tips and tricks on traveling. He has uh, 3 million miles of experience and it's only going to increase as he's headed towards Houston this weekend. And also headed to Houston is our grant winner, Brian. Um, he takes off this Saturday for the first leg of his trip. Um, he'll start, he'll go to Dallas for a night first, then off to Houston where he'll meet Mike and they will um, do a podcast there. And they are also going to the game on Tuesday, July 4th. Nothing better than baseball on July 4th, right? Um, so yeah, Mike, uh, it's all you. Uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks, um, Mike, Rosalie, uh, Flight for Sight. And are the other two grant winners on here and who who are they? Um, unfortunately, Mary Bai is not able to attend, but her, her grant winning partner, Eliana, is here. Hi. Okay, welcome, congratulations. And since they're Thank working you. closely together, I'm sure they can fill each other in. We have Brian Fischler who is on video. Currently on YouTube. Good to speak with you, Mike. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to meeting in person. Likewise. And we have Anthony Pitch Ryers coming from Belgium as our third uh, grand winner. Oh, nice. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> yeah, the founding uh, location of the <clears throat> OKO app. OK. OK, um, well, I'm going to share my tips and trips and tips and tricks and um, as Mike said based on a good three million miles of travel over I don't know 40 years or so uh, 33 countries with the dog with the cane with no vision with a little bit of vision so I have a pretty wide range of perspectives on this and uh, I'm sure people listening both uh, here live and, and recorded, will have different levels of experience and would have their own set of tips and tricks. So uh, I think it's a good idea to share those things with each other because we have a shared mission. And if we're on this call, if we're looking into it, then I think we all probably enjoy the puzzle that's involved in, in traveling as a person who's blind or visually impaired. And I tell my sighted friends that uh, we have the pleasure, if you want to look at it that way, of traveling with complexities that make that puzzle even more complicated than a sighted person might. Maybe they have a hundred piece puzzle and we have a thousand piece puzzle. So I'm going to talk about that sort of from start to finish of what's involved in, in that equation and really speak to the value of alternative tools and techniques because that's what it's all about. You gotta have a lot of options in your toolbox. And some of those are technology, some of them are just common sense and tenacity and ingenuity and, and all those kinds of personal traits. Uh, I think I'll start by just telling you uh, about a couple of stories that emphasize this idea of ingenuity and, and um, tenacity, because in the end, no matter how many alternative tools you use, uh, it's really up to you to finesse things as you go along to, so to do problem solving, but also to engage in what I call the people make the places. So it's not about going to Houston or Dallas or Belgium or wherever. People ask me, what's your favorite country? And I struggle to say what that is. What I remember about those travels are the people I met along the way. And those people might be the flight attendant, the taxi driver, uh, the random person I met into in a pub who invited me over to their house. And so, though you know, for me, that's what defines my travel. Um, so here's one experience. When I went to the 1984 Paralympics in Innsbruck, Austria, I competed. And at the end of the competition, they said for the first time ever, disabled people are going to be allowed to do a, do a demonstration at the regular Olympics. And these were at Sarajevo in 1984. And we thought, all right, fantastic, that's amazing. And they said, but, and here's where the other shoe dropped, we're only taking male amputees because we only have 28 spots for beds and 
uh, no women, no blind people, because they require a guide. So that's two people. And this is best we can do. Uh, we lobbied, we cajoled. No, it was just the amputees going. So the US team got together and flew back to the US. And my guide and I said, we're, we're staying around. We're going to go cheer on the amputees in Sarajevo. So we rented a car and my guide, Ron, drove us down to Sarajevo. Not an easy task. We got to the border and then they uh, were, were all worked up about my long-haired shepherd, Ricky. And finally, we got through that and then we get to a hotel and we're exhausted. We're not going to drive anywhere else. We're done. And we go to this one hotel and they see the dog and they say, no, no dogs allowed here. And we said, well, here's the situation. It's a guide dog, yada, yada. No, of course, they didn't have any guide dogs in uh, Yugoslavia, which, which was at the time Croatia now. And, and so we sat down in the lobby and just said, we're just going to sit here. And we spent a couple hours talking to patrons as they came through. And everybody was intrigued by the dog. And the owners could see that the dog was calm and wasn't doing anything. And I finally had a brainstorm. And this is dangerous when uh, these things happen. Uh, yes. Sometimes they, they get you into trouble. And the brainstorm was, I found out from one of the patrons that the mascot of the Olympics in Sarajevo was Vuchka. And Vuchka was a wolf. And they described Vuchka. And I thought, you know, he kind of sounds like what my dog looks like. So I went up to the counter and through broken communication with English and and uh, the local language, uh, I said, you know, this dog is the official mascot of the Olympics. This is Vuchka. And they kind of, you know, jammer on in their language and, and finally said, oh, my gosh, we're honored to have you here. Of course, we'll give you a room. We're happy to send steak up to the room. And uh, and uh, we got a suite. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted the steak. And, of course, the dog didn't get the steak. He got his dog food. But he got us into the room. Butchka was our ticket. And it kind of carried on like that from the, uh, the rest of the. We got into Sarajevo. There's no rooms. We finally we slept on somebody's floor. Then I thought, you know, with no tickets, you can't just show up in an Olympics with no tickets. Um, I called up somebody I knew at KCBS Radio. And I said, wouldn't you like to have uh, a recordings of the first ever disabled skiing competition? They said, oh, yeah, sure. We'll fax you uh, media certificates. So we did that. We got into the press facilities, which meant we could then get up front and center and interview all the, the famous skiers and ice skaters and hockey players. We were first to uh, to interview a lot of them. It was an amazing experience. I was just having a blast as a media person. And so when the competition for the disabled skiers finally came, we were there. We interviewed them. They all skied down the course, and uh, I was ready to ski down and and uh, you know be part of the celebration and have some uh, what do they call uh, trying to think of the Yugoslavian liquor that they have there. Um, I'll think of it. They. Um, and my guide, Ron, uh, said, hey, no, let's just jump into the starting gate. There's nobody here to stop us. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I usually like to ski down ahead, get a, a, a picture in my head of the course, but there's no time. So I hit the button on my recorder. We jumped into line and we started skiing down the slope. And I'm just praying, please, if you do one thing for me, don't I just don't want to fall. This is not be good on international media. So we ski down, we get to the bottom, and all of a sudden, my guide, who normally says tuck when we're supposed to go across the finish line, uh, he says, get out of the way. And we slide together, we kind of crash together, fall on the ground. There's all of this cheering and cameras clicking. And I said, Ron, what the hell was that about? He said there was a Yugoslavian soldier in the middle of the finish line pointing a gun at us. And I thought, oh, my gosh, uh, what have we gotten ourselves into? But everybody, you know, the media was all there. So we were safe at this point. Uh, we skied the first demonstration of a blind person at the Olympics ever, albeit uninvited. Uh, and so that's kind of how I've experienced the world. Not always that much uh, fanfare, 
but uh, plenty of times where you just get into situations that are uh, are really a blast because of just just going for it, interacting. We took a group of blind people. Um, we called our way fun trips, and we went to Ireland and Scotland. So there was about twenty blind people and their partners, and. The goal was, this was in about 2005, so GPS was just coming out. Let's all bring our different GPS devices. Let's go out and explore the town. And we were in Dublin, and we we normally would break up into groups of four because it's too hard to get a taxi in to get meals and stuff if you're you know, 30 people. But at the end, we said, let's all gather in this one place. We can have one big group dinner and celebrate our, our last day in Dublin, which we did. And we got there, and as the event organizer, I'm, of course, counting, and we're 28 people. And I'm thinking, oh, shoot. I mean, these are all grown-ups. They're all independent blind people. But I really didn't want to have somebody you know, get run over by a lorry or something in, in Dublin. It would not be good for the company or for the image of independent travel. And they never showed up. And I worried about them. The next morning, we come down. Some people just a little bit hungover, and the two people are there, and they're really hungover. And I said, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what happened to you guys? And they said, oh, we almost got to uh, Patrick's Pub, and we met these people. We were asking them from directions, and they said, oh, we have much better food than Patrick's Pub. Come to our house. So they went to their house, and they spent the evening partying with these two local Irish people who then put them up for the night and uh, had a blast. So the idea that the people make the places couldn't be any better than um, those kind of examples of people that you meet just spontaneously when you're out there going for it. Let me go now to the, the, the whole process of, you know, how, how do you get from here to there? Uh, you've got a, a book the flights and do some research ahead of time. Where do you want to go? And I always have trips in the queue. I have a trip in the queue right now to England and there's pieces that aren't done yet. We don't have any flights from London to Dublin. Uh, we don't have our trains booked. And so it's, you know, these things all take time and and um, and decision-making depending on who you're going with. So I, I got to figure out with my wife and then we're going to hook up with some people in the, in England. Uh, where, where are we going to share accommodations together? How How's that all going to happen? Uh, we just came back from Costa Rica in May, and my brother joined us, and we, so we had to collaborate on that trip. Uh, so it starts with uh, using different apps, and apps are from sort of medium accessible to completely accessible. So when I'm uh, booking flights, I often go to uh, Expedia. And I, I don't use Expedia to book the flight, but I look at, uh, to research it because I think they have the best interface with voiceover. And you it's very nicely laid out how you put in your destination and when you want to go. And then they give you all the different airlines. And then when I find the airline that I want, then I go and I, I fly mostly on United because I have their their perks. You know, I get upgraded more often. And so there's a lot of benefit to to doing that when you can. Same thing with some of the hotels. You get a lot of pretty cool perks if you're one of their top tier uh, residents. And so then I go to United typically, but sometimes it's other airlines. Uh, United, I mean, Southwest is not on any of these interfaces. So you have to go to Southwest if you think they're the ones you're going to use. And I will use them locally in California, Nevada. If it's a direct trip just to Los Angeles or something, I'll use Southwest. But otherwise, for longer trips, I use United and their partners to build up those miles. So they they have me as a, a loyal, frequent flyer. Uh, so I use, then I'm United app. I book it and it's, I'd call it 98% accessible. With any of these things, accessibility or usability is a function of getting used to that app. So that's the other benefit of becoming a frequent flyer. You get to know the app. Uh, their policies, their benefits, uh, and their airports. So I know, I've memorized Chicago, Denver, San Francisco, Frankfurt. I can tell you where the clubs are, uh, where the restaurants are that I like, where the dog relief areas are. And you get that in your head, then it's a lot easier once you get there. So I'm, I'm a big fan of flying on the same airline. 
You also get to know what their dog form procedures are. Um, that's always a, a complexity. And I do make a decision before flying, should I bring the dog or not? Um, I think, in, in my view, a dog is to give you independence and not to tie you down. Uh, and I have to think about that sometimes because there are situations where the dog may interfere with your independence. And it's good to be realistic about that, as well as thinking about the welfare of the dog. So if I'm going to the UK for just a couple of days and then I'm moving on to other uh, countries or cities frequently, it's not great for the dog to just spend most of their time on a flight. Uh, you can get them through it, but I, for me, it's not ideal. So if I'm going on a short trip, I leave the dog at home. It's a longer trip and one where I'm going to be using the dog a lot, then I make the decision because you have to go through the expense, which is several hundred dollars in order to get your vet to authorize the dog, to get the paperwork, to get things FedExed. If you have to get the special uh, tighter certification, from uh, Kansas State University and some of these other things, it gets expensive, time consuming and adds to the complexity of the trip. So that's just as a dog user, something to be thought about. Um, the other thing I do is, um, so I, I get my paperwork in place. I have a travel agent that I really, really appreciate because she knows all the ropes been doing this for many, many years. It's a dying breed, travel agents. Everybody does it on their own. But she charges 50 bucks. And if it's a complicated trip, at least with one stop, uh, I will usually book through her because if something goes wrong and everybody's scrambling to get up to the desk and, and change their flights, or you're sitting on the airplane and people are calling in to get, uh, you know, standby on other flights, I just call her and she takes care of it. She's on it. She's got all my details. She changes me. She backs up me on other flights. She has gotten her weight in gold any number of times for that 50 bucks when things go haywire. And they don't often, but often enough that I'm really happy to have that done. She uploads the dog form. So there's no worry with that. I don't have any problem once I get to the airport. And so I don't want to go to the front desk and bother with that. I It just means you have to get to the airport half an hour, even earlier if you go to the front. So I just go through security. Uh, that can vary from place to place, as, as Brian and others can tell you with dogs, that um, it can be pretty dicey. Um, I like to, you have to be careful about taking control because they don't want to be told what to do. But I've refined my technique, which is uh, I... I put all my stuff on the on the uh, conveyor belt, and then I walk up to the scanner and I I say I say uh, hello, and they say hi. Uh, I said I'm I'm going to walk through first, and then my dog's going to come through second. She's going to need a pat down. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, okay, they always say fine. They don't you know they don't say do it another way. I mean we hear stories about saying we'll take the dog's harness off and let the dog you know then the dog runs loose and runs through the airport. That's happened. Never happened to me, but uh, I do it this way and I walk through with confidence. So my dog comes through and I say, uh, she likes the pat down, so feel free. Some of them are afraid to pat the dog down, but you know they always find somebody who isn't and they pat the dog down. I get my stuff and we go. Um, one little tidbit is that with a large bag of dog food, almost all the time, it flags the scanner and they pull my suitcase off and then they have to open up the whole darn thing and look through it. And it, you know, it adds another 10 minutes or more. So I make a point now of carrying my dog food in a separate pouch and then they don't have to bother with that. Then I put it into my other suitcase once I'm through security and uh, I don't have to deal with that. Okay. Now you're through security. How do you find your way to the gate? Of course, there's multiple ways to do it. Some people like to use a meet and greet person. I prefer to figure it out on my own for a couple of reasons. You, you always have to get to the airport early. And I'm, I really like to have plenty of time on my hands because you don't know what's going to go wrong. I didn't mention booking an Uber or a ride share, but that can be another complexity on the way to the airport uh, because maybe they want to reject your dog. 
and or they're delayed or something happens. So I give extra time because of the Uber and I get to the airport uh, and, you know, go through security and all this stuff. So I've got time on my hands. I want to find the gate myself. I sometimes use Ira. Uh, I use a scene AI uh, app. It's amazing that if you have that app in your pocket or in a pouch on a lanyard or a pouch on your backpack, it picks up the overhead gate signs pretty well. You can walk along and it says B37, B35. You get the gates read out to you. It's just fun. I feel feel like a little kid a lot of times just figuring this out on my own. You know, this is part of the puzzle, you know. <clears throat> so we're 500 pieces into the puzzle now. And, uh, but uh, sometimes I'll, I'll use a, a person or I'll ask security at least to get me started in the right direction or I'll call, call Ira. Um, Ira is good when the, c the connection is good. If it's not good, then the agent spends more time having to refresh and tell you to um, you know, turn this way and turn that way. Then if you just ask the person uh, which way are things, then you get quicker uh, information and, and quicker navigation. So it's part of the toolbox to use Ira or be my eyes if, if you have that both and um but also to use sighted people and there's techniques involved in how do you engage with sighted people people who are particularly totally blind might not that be that good at um at eye contact and sighted people want eye contact they don't know if they're talking to you or not people have headphones on um they speak other languages so there's any number of reasons that you flag somebody down and they, they don't do anything but sometimes if you stand around and look lost, people come up to you and, and ask you, or do you need some help? And <clears throat> I like them saying, okay, go straight. And then when you get to the intersection, turn left. So I like to do that on my own and then figure it out because I have a much greater sense of the space and the details than if I'm walking with somebody, I don't really learn all that stuff because I might be talking to them. And uh, I just learn a lot more when I'm doing it on my own than if I'm uh, being guided. And I think that's probably true of most people. Um, so if I can learn an airport, and that's how I've learned Denver, Chicago, and the others, because I've done it on my own and I have had, had to get lost. And you get into the rotunda at uh, on the B concourse at Denver and there's escalators on both sides and it's a weird shape and escalators in the way going up. It's complicated to figure that out. I also have a tactile compass that I use, an old fashioned tactile compass to sometimes just reset myself in terms of uh, which way things are oriented. So I get through the airport, uh, get onto the flight, of course. You know, I, I do take advantage of pre-boarding. No, I think one of the perks of being blind, uh, I certainly don't need extra time to walk down or any of that stuff. You hear these horror stories you know, about everybody getting in a wheelchair and you have 20 people getting on in wheelchairs and none of them get off. You know, they just walk off because they want to pre-board early. So we get to do that. It's a perk. Uh, overhead space is at a premium. I want to put my stuff above my seat and know where it is uh, so I can retrieve it easily when I get out and uh, also get my dog settled and talk to the flight attendants and tell them things you know they they often uh i mean they'll come by and they'll give you a briefing <clears throat> some of the time but not all the time they're supposed to but the thing that i find annoying is that i have headphones on and then i get skipped when it comes to the service so if i don't tell them my name is mike uh, please call out my name when you come by or i won't know you're you're uh serving um so that you know that's kind of an important detail, and if you if you miss out on food, it's kind of a drag. Um, that's probably on the plane. One of the, the only things that I really worry about. I've memorized uh, most of the seats on the United aircraft, the seven thirty seven seven hundreds, and the and the Airbuses that they use. And I like seat seven F with a dog because. There's a, a half wall between first class and coach and that half wall, my dog can slide under and be three quarters in first class. And then, you know, right up against my feet, there's tons of room. The seven a side isn't always good because some of those seven thirty sevens have a bathroom there. So they don't have a half wall. They have a bathroom in front of you. 
So you got to learn these things. And there are sites where you can look up uh, the planes and, you know, there's like seatgeek.com and some of these things. Um, I also use a number of tools to know when I get off the plane, uh, where do I book a hotel? Uh, I used, of course, I have a GPS app. Um, Good Maps Outdoors is the one that I use because it started out as CNI GPS, which I developed at Sendero Group when we started with that app in 2012. And then it went to Ira, and now it's to Good Maps, where I worked for four years. So having a good GPS app is helpful. I like to do virtual exploration. Uh, there's uh, an app we developed at my company, Sendero Group, called PC Maps and runs on windows and you can put in destinations and explore them virtually with the arrow keys so i like to know okay i'm thinking about this hotel how many restaurants are nearby so i can do a search for restaurants near the marriott at uh, marble arch in london and it'll tell me how many are around how far away they are they're they're ranked by proximity so i'm using that that virtual tool it's a bit outdated now, but um, points of interest go away. Streets mostly stay the same. So it's still a good research tool. There's a very cool app being developed by a friend uh, at Georgia Tech called Audium, A-U-D-I-O-M. And it's a modern version of this. And it's not quite out yet, but it will be out soon. And uh, I think it's, it's something that'll be a, a great research tool for you ahead of time. But the, you wanna know before you go, whenever possible, what to expect, because when you're actually moving with your dog or your cane, you wanna have some idea of, uh, you know, where is the Uber pickup? Um, when I get dropped off at the hotel, is this a hotel in the middle of town or am I stuck out by some freeway on-ramp uh, where, you know, the only restaurant you can get to is the one in the hotel? So you got to research all this stuff ahead of time. Um, I'd also mention uh, advocacy. I mean, it's hard work. Um, you're always having to uh, fend for yourself. And there's a fine line between when things are a pain in the ass and when they're exciting because you accomplish something. I mean, something as simple as going into a restaurant and the host um, says, follow me. And then they just take off. Silence. You know, it's in a noisy restaurant. Where do they go? Um, you you got to you gotta know how to tell them right off the bat. Uh, or, could I take your arm? Or my dog will follow you. Or could you call out directions as we go? And we know how sighted people are at restaurants, at hotels. Anytime you ask people for directions, they say, it's over there. It's up there go that way, go down there. Down and up do not mean vertical and, and, and down. They, they mean go the way that I'm pointing. So it's really hard to extract left and right out of sighted people. Um, but it's something you got to deal with. And you, you don't, you know, you don't want to get grumpy with them. That doesn't really help. Sometimes when you're tired and you've been traveling for 24 hours and there's jet lag, maybe we're not at our best. But it's something that uh, you know, you have to deal with. The same kind of advocacy might happen when you go to concerts or going to a baseball game. So we're just talking about going to the, the Astros game. What do we think about with our dogs? Well, we don't want to be sit and sitting in the baking sun. It, I don't mind getting roasted, but I don't want my dog to get roasted. Uh, the ground can be sticky with all kinds of gunk. And so what do you do? Do you bring something for your dog to lay on? When you book tickets, how do you get under an overhang so that um, it's not it, you're in the shade? It's not too too bad. What about listening to the game? Do they have a delayed broadcast, or do they have real time um, broadcast the way they used to? A lot of the stadiums don't anymore. So you know, again, it's like all this research that a sighted person wouldn't have to think about. They just go. Uh, if you're going on a cruise ship you know figuring out where's the dog relief area they they want to know shall i put the relief pad on your balcony if you have a balcony or should i put it on the fourth floor um quarter deck these kind of things if you're going on a zip line how are you going to do that you're going to get there and people will have never met a blind person before uh, where's your dog going to stay while you're on the zip line uh how are you going to go on the zip line i mean some of them you have to kind of lean one way and the other so you don't hit the trees. 
um, you can go tandem. Um, there's, there's different things to figure out ahead of time, but it it really a lot of times it comes down to engaging with people last minute at the venue. When we're just in Costa Rica, we had to do a lot of that because we just couldn't prepare for all this ahead of time. Sometimes you can't get through to the relevant people. You can only prep so much. So you got to be pre prepared to wing it when you get there and be prepared that sometimes you get, uh, you know, <clears throat> you get rejected. Uh, just like we get rejected in Uber sometimes and have to order another one. Uh, it's not fun for to have that kind of discrimination. But I've had it happen to me on zip lines where my eight-year-old niece got to go, but they wouldn't let the blind guy go. Uh, it's pretty frustrating. Zoos sometimes could be that kind of place. So, um, you know, these are all things that um, you have to think through, but mostly be prepared to have some ingenuity, like I talked about with Vuchka and any number of other situations uh, that you look at it as public puzzle solving and it's part of the adventure. People make the places. So I'll, I'll share with you some of my other mottos to just think about and explain them a little bit. And then I'll break because we're about 15 minutes before the hour and maybe people have a few questions. Um, I always tell people in my talks and particularly when I'm speaking to O&M people, the better you get around, the better you engage in life. And people talk about visual acuity, you know, are you 2200, 2400? I think there should be life acuity because there's people with 2200 who are afraid they don't get out and they have really poor life acuity, but they have good visual acuity. There's totals who have good life acuity, but no acuity, they can't see it all. Uh, I have another expression, which I say, and we talk about in software, a lot of times you say, is it a bug or a feature? Sometimes you find a bug that turns out to be a feature. And there's a story about the guy named uh, Mr. Bot, who bots dots. Those are the things that go down the middle of the road, the bumps that people feel when they go from lane to lane. And Mr. Bot was a truck driver and he realized that potholes were the things that kind of woke him up when he was getting a little bit drowsy. And then he thought, what if you could organize those potholes into a pattern so they alerted you when you were going out of your lane? Thus was invented Bot's dots. And he got a penny each for millions of those dots. So, um, you know, that's a bug or a feature. And it's the same thing with blind people. I've been preparing to be inventive since I was three when I went blind. So the better you get around, the better you engage in life, you know, important to have good life acuity. I also like to say, talk about the power of getting unlost. So we spend our lives with O&M instructors or people trying to help you not get lost to begin with. But I advocate for the power of getting unlost, which means if you know how to get unlost, either through technology like GPS or other techniques, then you can really go exploring a lot more than if you're stuck to a particular route, destination oriented, because you know, you're afraid of getting lost. Embrace being lost. Uh, I think that's there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, remember the accessible toolbox and you can't have everything in it. It costs too much, but uh, you should figure out what works best for you. That should include sighted people, when to use them, when not to use them. Uh, the know before you go with virtual exploration. Uh, and there's a saying, not by me, but uh, a lot of people, and there's different versions of this, which say, it's better to travel hopefully than to arrive, where some people say it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So I think that speaks a lot to what uh, Flight for Sight is about, is in um, enabling people to go have the journey and share it with everybody else and try to make it uh, better for uh, people who are blind or, or visually impaired to navigate this very complicated puzzle. Deep breath. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Mike. I have I have uh, I have a number of questions, but one I just want to ask: What does O and O and M mean for? Sorry, a sighted Ori person. Yeah, orientation and mobility. The people that teach us how to get around. Okay. 
And does anyone have any questions? Uh, Brian has a question, go ahead. Currently unmuted. Not a question, but to expand on something that Mike said, um, Blind Square GPS has a virtualization mode, which I found, as Mike mentioned, very helpful when you're checking out a new location. And uh, it's a great app, obviously fully accessible, and it works on a global scale. Um, so that's something that uh, my fellow travelers may want to check out. Yeah, Blind Square is a great app. It costs a little bit, but well worth it. And the way the virtual mode works is you pick a point of interest and then you ask for what other points are around that point. You you can't explore the way you can on the PC with arrow keys, like go down the streets and, and expand your exploration, but it's a pretty good implementation on a touch screen to, to learn about a certain area. And have, Soundscape had a, had a version of that too, but Soundscape just got discontinued this month. Currently unmuted. There's something in development, Mike, called OpenScape, but I don't believe it's on the market yet. I think it's just in beta, which is picking up where Soundscape left off, by the way. Yeah, certain parts of Soundscape are open sourced. Um, unfortunately, it's, you know, maybe 50% of what Soundscape was because Microsoft owns a lot of the, uh, the uh, IP, but um, hopefully that will take advantage of some things on Soundscape. And we just put um, uh, the 3D audio component of Soundscape on Good Maps Outdoors, which is being released this week. So the, the 3D audio means that when something says it's at 11 o'clock, you're hearing it if you have on stereo headphones like the Aftershocks, which I'm wearing right now. Uh, and I highly recommend for everybody because they don't cover your ears that uh, you will get a, a 3D stereo image of that point of interest, uh, not just the, the 11 o'clock announcement. Um, I have a question that I imagine a number of people would have. Are you willing to share your travel agent? <laughs> Who is this mirac miraculous one? Yeah, yeah. I've, if, if anybody's interested, um, just shoot me a, a text and I'll connect you with her. She sounds great. Um, so we think that uh, Mary Bai and Eliana might be traveling to Ireland and or Scotland. And so I wondered if you and, and England, they will definitely be in England. Do you have contacts there or specific tips or tricks for those? Countries? Yeah, if they, you know, if, if they're talking, it really depends where they are in their trip. If they already know where they want to go, that's one thing. If they want suggestions um, or people to connect with, I can certainly give them uh, some feedback on that. I think Hi, that Mike. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your tips. And it's been so helpful. We definitely know we're going to be starting in Birmingham, England, because that's where Mary Bai is meeting up with me after my goalball trip. Um, and then we kind there's of have a great aquarium there. Is there? See, this is already great. Um, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't think of Birmingham in the, you know, the heartland yeah. of uh, midlands of England as having a good aquarium, but I really enjoyed it. And there's also, um, which chocolate company is it Toblerone that's based there so is it you know, okay chocolate tour is good to do too oh of course always so yeah and maybe we can connect after this if you have because we were thinking maybe going through Scotland and over to Ireland we have a place what time of year will you be there end of August okay there's a conference in Birmingham called site site village um which is in July though I think um I'm going to okay. be in the UK end of august beginning of september that's our trip what are you going to be uh -huh. anywhere near birmingham probably not birmingham we're going to york to bath and uh, then we'll go to dublin we'll be in london we're going to a wedding i don't know if you maybe you follow um lucy edwards she's a blind um uh, yeah TikTok person. i actually i've seen her stuff yes yeah lucy's getting married at the end of august so my wife and i are going to her, her wedding Oh, how neat. I Yeah, I've seen her her videos before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's great about everything, you know, navigating bathrooms, putting on makeup, you name it. Well, maybe we'll have to connect after this if we could if we could cross paths on our trip because we're trying to also go to Ireland. So we'll have to um, see if we yeah. can connect. That'd be right. really cool. 
Yeah, I love Dublin and I could probably uh, connect you with a couple of locals there because that's that's always the best way to find the tips about what's around. Are you familiar with goalball at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I played yeah goalball. So we have the Ip we have the IPSA World Games um, August 17th to the 27th. Oh, and they're in Birmingham. In, in Bur Shoot. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think I don't think we could get up there, but that would I'll think about that. That would be fun. All righty. It looks like we've lost Anthony, our other uh, grant winner, but that's probably because it's like three o'clock in the morning for him in Belgium. Oh, gosh. Um, but I guess I, I'm going to direct the conversation a little bit to uh, Brian's trips and experiences. I don't know if you would have seen the blogs that we've started posting of the experiences Brian's had so far booking his flights. And um, I wondered if you had noticed a significant impact of the changes that were made to the, the rules as of June of 2021 with the changes in, uh, Brian can speak to it better. But did you notice when they changed a lot of the rules? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, I submitted feedback. You know, a lot of us advocated ahead of time. Uh, we weren't happy with the final rules, but they could have been worse. And it's because the airlines had to deal with the proliferation of the emotional support Anthony animals. Anthony Pitt-Rears joined this channel. And they're, they're, I mean, they're still bad, but they're tenfold less than they used to be. So that's a, that's a huge benefit to the airlines. And uh, I think people with legitimate service dogs have taken a hit in the process. Um, I, I mean, I see all of the announcements on Facebook about people with nightmare uh, things with the forms, but I I fill out at the beginning of the year the Department of Transportation form once for one airline, and I just take it with me. I go to the gate, and even Southwest, who can be a little bit persnickety, you know, you, you're supposed to fill out our form and do it our way. You're supposed to go to the front debt, front counter and all that. I've never gotten booted from a flight. Sometimes I get a little bit of grief, but um, that one form has suited me well. And I heard Brian talking about spending eight hours having to you know go through each airline and and do this stuff so i i guess you can do it that way but uh, my way seems to work for me currently i'm muted hey mike um i'm fascinated to hear because i i'm you mentioned you fly in united all the time i had a fun experience with united because one they asked me the height of my dog which i don't think if you ask sighted people the height of their dogs they'd know that and two they suggested i purchase a seat next to me which that was baffling. That airline. You, you got somebody. You got somebody who was not trained. I mean, they they yeah. just that's that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. They, um, the only time they ask, the only time they ask the size of the dog is if you're on a small flight, like in the Caribbean, and they they ask your weight as well as the dog's weight, and we got that in Costa Rica as well. That explains why I don't go to the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> I I cruise to the Caribbean if I'm going, but. Yeah, the, uh, the other thing, Delta made me fly, fill out a separate form that you had to upload. And, uh, you know, I've already printed out all my forms. And, you know, once we got through it, uh, but it was just really head scratching that it was this involved. Yeah. And, and I figured better to be safe than sorry. Uh, the form that you're talking about, I'm assuming that you print out is that Department of Transportation form. I've printed out multiple copies of that to take with me on the trip. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I have. And the only time they've questioned it is when it was last year and they said, well, this is kind of old, you know, because <laughs> I, I just was using the same one for a long time. Then I thought, OK, I'm going to update it beginning of each year. And and the travel agent, she will upload it for me. And so she takes the path of least resistance. And if I'm on another like like um, American, then she'll upload it just to make sure because they, they all you know have a little it depends who you run into and you don't don't always have to want to seek out a crow a complaint resolution officer to deal with the situation it's just too stressful one last question mike i'll let somebody else jump in by the way this is brian if anybody didn't know that sorry i didn't announce my name you are a much calmer individual than me i when i get hassled with my guide dog or other things sometimes go from I'm going to try and do my best on this trip from zero to nuclear a little too quickly. When you're dealing with a horrible situation, how do you remain calm? What techniques do you use? Well, 
I don't feel calm inside, believe me. And that's always the tough part. You know, the adrenaline is pumping. But, you know, when, when somebody attacks your kid or your dog, you know, it's a natural protective instinct. Like, don't do that. Uh, I'm I'm thinking that. But I'm also trying to prevail with the idea of do the most productive thing. And if that means sucking up, I try to suck it up. If it means, um, you know, get a supervisor, I do that. I don't back down. So I'm not afraid to be really stubborn about something. But the TSA people are particularly dicey because they can make your life miserable if you get nasty with them. So I think that's the place where you want to kowtow uh, when you have to. But if if they ask me to take my dog's leash off, there's no way I, I would refuse and, you know, that's where I would draw the line. So Anthony is back. I don't know if he had any specific questions or just uh, comments based on his experience traveling mainly in Europe. Yeah, hello, hello, hello. This is me uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning. Yes. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for all the tips and the tricks that you've already been given, giving here. Um, one small question that I had is that if your travel agent also operates outside of the US. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and I've been to Belgium. She's booked my flights there. I have a, a best friend who lives there, works for the International Crisis Group. And uh, mm -hmm. so she, yeah, she and she's got a lot of corporate clients who, you know, fly every week. So she's used to dealing with much more complex situations than mine. Okay, well, that, that's cool. I, I might send you an email on that one because obviously I have to do complex trips all the time with my job. So, you know, that would be What's really nice. Job? But my job is I'm a DJ and producer. So I, I have to often like play gigs and festivals and go from the one club to the other and and mm. stuff like that. So oh, in this cool. case, yeah. Yeah, well, I look forward to hearing about your adventure then too. I assume that's going to be part of it. Definitely, definitely. It's a uh, definitely an, a very interesting environment to navigate when you can also not hear, not even because I have a hearing impairment, I actually do. But then also because the a lot of the environments that you're in have more than 100 decibel sounds. Oh, my God. All the things you say then, you know. <laughs> that's no so way. That's the worst. That's my nightmare. Is you, get, you go into bars these days and they're so loud. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah absolutely. You're, you're deaf and blind. Yeah. I mean, it's like for me, the only thing that I can do there is like surround myself with good people at some point because you lose, especially when you're like playing for like a big 20,000 people arena. If you're getting somewhere in the audience there, you you never get back. You know, it's like, I mean, you, you can because the raving culture is luckily a very nice one. You know, everyone, everyone will help you. But, you know. It's it's definitely some some you definitely have to be keep calm in that these kind of situations otherwise you oh don't get out of there. <laughs> yeah, well, my um, so, somewhat similar experience in in big crowds like that is I'm I've I've traveled a lot with Stevie Wonder. We're good friends, yeah. and he's he's in he's had me um, up on stage with him, not to play an instrument, but for different reasons. It was my birthday once in New Zealand. He oh, called me yeah, up. And okay. He did the Happy Birthday song. And hearing, hearing the music from the stage vantage point when you have um, 100,000 people out in a festival was uh, really amazing. We're... Somebody asked a question about a, uh, a venue if you've been to in Belgium. Yeah, it's a, it's a festival. It's called Pukkelpop. Uh, it's, I've never been there, but... Uh... Because it's not it's not necessarily my thing. Like and, and the, the thing is like I, I do like to do festivals, but I have to be very cautious of them because you know my hearing is very precious to me. So I try to limit my exposure to loud venues to the ones in which I have to be for my job. Um uh -huh. or unless I get backstage <laughs> access. You know, if I get back uh yeah, they do they do work, but my ears are really sensitive. So even if I get like a minus 25 dB uh like earplug like uh custom mm -hmm. molded even then if i if i would go for a whole night it will still tire my ears out so i really really have to so you know i i generally do gigs when i when i get backstage access or when when i have to play because then i can you know retire in a 
in a spot where it's more quiet and basically there's less people and you can actually network with some guys and whatever and all that. Mm -hmm. That's usually more productive. Um, but yeah, I've, I've not been to Pukal Pop. I've been to Tomorrowland, but not to Pukal Pop. And those are questions coming out of the chat, which I assume Anthony has some techie device to have the comments read to him. Yeah. Which yeah, is called iPhone. No, yeah, it's announcing <laughs> on our voiceover. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're at eight o'clock, but uh, you know, if anyone else has any more questions, uh, I think. Yeah, hi, this is hi, this is Mike Royal and uh, Brian and Mike. I'm about an hour from Minute Maid Park in the Greater Houston area. So, uh, if you, when you're down here, you know, gladly take you out for a water ski set, board set, uh, something like that. If uh, you can work it in, I know it's last minute, so. What a nice, uh, nice yeah. offer. Do you, do you, you know about the National Federation of the Blind Convention in Houston? Uh, yeah, I'm not attending it, but uh, yeah, I yeah. know what's going on down there. Yeah, that's my business reason for being there. So I'll be tied up with that the, the whole time. Uh, but that I, I haven't water skied in a number of years, but I've at, at different points, you know, skied. Uh, single skied and even uh, I had a cousin in Tennessee we used to ski every day and we'd build pyramids like a four four three two pyramid currently unmuted I have not water skied this is Brian since I had an incident with a water moccasin when I was 12 years oh. old in Florida I never <laughs> went back in the water again dang slam, slam across me but I'm also attending the NFB conference uh but you know we'll see we'll see we're trying to figure out all the details of the schedule thanks so much and Mike Royal has a lot of experience with guide dogs. Uh, <laughs> Is that right? So, I mean, yeah, I've been driving with them since 93. Yeah, I got my current one from Fidelco, and I've had five different dogs from three different schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've seen my wife is actually raising puppies for Southeastern guide dogs right now. So we're, we usually have at least two dogs around the house. Um, to answer the chat, um, no, U.S. airlines don't do that, but I know WestJet does that in Canada. I have friends that fly down, and uh, you know what they'll do. What I do when United is, I'll say, if is the plane full, and they always say yes. I say, well, if there's an empty seat open and it's convenient, it'll be more comfortable for my seatmate and for everybody if you can make that empty seat next to me. <clears throat> and probably fifty percent of the time, they accommodate that. It's best to tell the person at the front uh, counter and also to tell the flight attendants because uh, sometimes one or the other can be helpful. So that's a really good point. If you can get the seat next to you free, that's that's as good as being upgraded to first class. And if everybody can't see the comments, uh, Canada has can and Canada Air and WestJet that will give a guide person a free seat on flights within the country. Um, so it's at least two flights, two places we know if you happen to be traveling in Canada that you can get that benefit, but we're not aware of any here in the U.S., unfortunately. Yeah, not U.S. airlines, but I think WestJet will do the same if even if you're flying from Canada to the U.S., it's just <clears throat> their company policy. Are you still going to Toronto, uh, Brian, or did that get cut? Oh, no. Unfortunately, I think uh, Toronto got cut when we started mapping this out, just to, you know, the schedule and the locations. I learned really quickly, the team has got to be at home for the, all this to work out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no kidding. <laughs> and your scheduler has to be very patient. Yes, Mike Walsh has been fantastic. because We've had a lot of moving parts, and uh, I think he's regretting all of this already. It has been interesting. Carry on. <laughs> Mike, I, I, you, sh you should turn it over to the travel agent. Yes. Um, does she have a nonprofit rate? <laughs> um, I, think, I think 50 bucks a, a, a trip. If you string them all together, it would be one trip. So maybe. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> oh, $50 for 15 flights, Pump, huh, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, my mom says we owe her 350 you know, for uh, all the help she's given us, you know, <laughs> $50 a flight. All right. Well, I, I'll, I would like to learn the details. Yeah, maybe she can just train you. <laughs> Give both of us some tips so we can be better at coordinating and helping plan these trips. 
I love Excel spreadsheets and spreadsheets. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, we are past um, seven o'clock, which is where I am in the central time. Um, but I would be remiss not to uh, mention this. Mike talked about Ira in his little in his 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 excellent um, talk. Ira is now a sponsor of ours. They are giving us a hundred minutes to each winner. Um, and we're really excited about that to have nice. a sponsor on board. Um, we're just, you know, a small, mighty nonprofit and just developing these, these relationships. Thanks to Brian. Brian introduced us to the people there. And our first podcast is up. Brian, the workhorse, the man, the blogger, the podcaster, all in the last week. Um, that is up. It's on Spotify. It is on Apple. Is it on Apple too? Uh, our first podcast. It is any podcast player. Uh, you should be able to type in the search box flight for sight. And our first interview was with Everett Bacon, uh, who is new to IRA and also the secretary over at the NFB. So he'll be at that conference as well. And Everett and I had a fun time chatting and it worked out well because Everett grew up in Dallas so Everett suggested a bunch of places for us to hit up when we're in Dallas, which was really cool. Well, and it's probably worth mentioning that a lot of airports have free IRA use. So use those 100 minutes judiciously outside of the airports where it's not free. Currently unmuted. Excellent. Yes. Um, is... Go ahead. All the airports that I'm hitting except one uh, are IRA hotspots. It's something we discuss in the podcast. And they're interested for us to uh, test out IRA at ballparks and, and see how it does. And, you know, try and get into somebody's ear there. Hey, are you familiar? You know, they're probably not familiar at IRA at ballparks, but uh, try and talk to some people there. Yeah, I, I used it, Brian, um, testing it out at the A's because of the, the fact that I didn't have the option of real time radio. And the camera just can't see enough to be useful. Uh, and you need to have an agent that knows baseball. So when I got an agent uh, and I, I got in the first row and um, the agent said, the guy's running from third to fourth base. I thought, <laughs> oh, maybe not the right base. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, but it would be good for um, for going up and uh, navigating around the, you know, the hot dog stands and, you know, getting food. Currently unmuted. Yeah, that's what I figured. All right. Um, is that, I think that's any other questions, uh, last minute, let's see. I think we should respect everyone's time. Is anything else, Rosalie? That is it. That's all right. Great. Well, thank you. thank you so much, everyone. And Mike May, what a, an incredible treat, all your stories. I hope everyone has learned a lot. Yo, right. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And, uh, we'll look forward to hearing more about how everybody proceeds on their adventures. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.